Uh, good morning. I am Professor Gadgil, meeting you for the first time for your course in Continuum Mechanics or Master's course in Structural Engineering. I am first of all glad that you have chosen the Structural Engineering as a field of specialization for your higher education. When you have done your graduation, you had several options to pursue your career. One of that was to go for higher education. This needs a commitment for almost two years and I am quite sure that after due deliberations and maybe proper advice from the seniors, we have taken this decision to take up <coughs> this course in Structural Engineering Masters. In that also you have taken admission to VZTI which is a very renowned institute there for almost more than 125 years and this course itself is almost 50 years uh, old you can say uh, in the institute this is one of the finest course in civil engineering as far as your basic education is concerned you have done your graduation in civil engineering in civil engineering you have seen that in every semester you had a course related to structural engineering branch namely you had studied mechanics engineering mechanics statics or dynamics then you have studied strength of materials or mechanics of solids deformable solids at that then you have studied structural analysis then you have studied structural design in steel as well as in concrete you have also studied the some of you may be structural dynamics or earthquake engineering. Now, civil engineering is a vast branch in engineering and in that structural engineering is a very important branch. The Many times it is also called as the backbone of civil engineering because major work of civil engineering or civil engineer relates to in one way or the other structural engineering. If you consider the outline of the coursework which you will be pursuing in semester 1, this current semester, you will see that you have a course in computational mechanics, then you have this continuum mechanics which I will be considering, experimental methods in structural engineering, one more subject of uh, great importance. Then you have advanced geotechnical engineering. You have studied some of these courses in the earlier years also, but now you are going to study that in a different perspective. And you have two electives if you see your coursework. The two electives which you have to select are among the three which are offered. One is the non-linear analysis, then you have the mechanics of composite materials and the repairs and rehabilitation of structures. If you see the various subjects which you will be pursuing, and you will see that one of the subject is computational methods. You have studied various subjects or various topics in structural engineering, wherein you see that in many of the problems that you have tackled, you have to deal with some equations. So you have formulated the problem in terms of a mathematical equation maybe a differential equation or algebraic equation or integral equation and so on and so forth and later on there are methods available for solving these uh, method uh, solving these equations the <coughs> computational methods will essentially deal with the solution of different equations which you come across in structural engineering then you have the experimental methods in structural engineering again a very important branch of civil uh, structural engineering for that matter wherein you will see that any theory that you study would be of any value provided the predicted results and the observed results that you get for a structure are in reasonably close agreement thus your experimental methods ensure that the theories that you have studied, the assumptions you have made in formulating those various equations 
are reasonably accurate and represent the true phenomenon or the true behavior of the structure. Then you have the advanced geotechnical engineering, which again a structural engineer just can't avoid because his structure, most of the civil engineering structures that you come across would finally rest on the mother earth or the soil as such and as such the behavior of the entire structure will depend on the foundation that you are providing. The foundation will be of uh, two different aspects, a structural foundation you are providing and the geotechnical aspect of the soil that will be considered. As far as the electives are concerned, you have two electives to be selected. One is the non-linear analysis, wherein for all these years you have always been studying the linear analysis, where the material world was always considered as linearly elastic and the structure was always considered to be linearly elastic. But now there are situations where you have to go beyond linear elasticity in terms of material behavior, in terms of geometry of the structure and so on and so forth. And you will be studying that part in this one subject elective, the non-linear analysis. You have mechanics of composite materials, again a very advanced topic because composites are being used extensively in many applications, not only in civil engineering but also in mechanical, aerospace, electrical and so on and so forth. Then you have the next elective in terms of repairs and rehabilitation of structures because many times you have a structure with some predicted life over there. Later on, once the effective life of the structure is over due to one reason or the other or if some damage occurs to the structure, then you have two options. One is to pull down the structure and build a new one, very expensive one and other would be to repair and rehabilitate the structure. So there are various new techniques available for carrying out repairs and rehabilitation of structures and you will be studying that. As far as the continuum mechanics is concerned with which we will be concerned with in this coursework, we will be considering various aspects of continuum mechanics though of course strictly speaking it is an extension of what you have studied in solid mechanics or strength of materials. But it is a refinement of what you have studied over there. The same problems which you have studied in strength of material, we will study them in more detail, making less and less number of assumptions and go for a more accurate solution of those problems. Not only that, we will also systematize our entire studies in mechanics of solids and address many problems which we were not able to solve in the earlier course. Like if you consider the torsion of a non-circular section. So earlier you have studied torsion problem but you have always considered it to be a circular section, made some assumptions about its behavior and then got a simple torsion formula which related the torsional moment to the torsional stress, the shear stress or the twist of the shaft and so on and so on. But <clears throat> there are other types of problems also which you were not able to touch in the earlier courses. But now we will be considering such types of problems, particularly if you consider a plate with a hole. Now many times what we do is when you have to provide a hole for connecting two members using rivets or bolts, then what we do is we calculate the net area at the section and then say that okay area is reduced so to that extent the stress is increased and we say that okay my design is complete but at a microscopic level that's not very true near the vicinity of the hole stresses are increased many fold three times four times and so on depending upon the shape of the hole and so on and if those stresses go beyond the threshold value, then many times the failure of the component occurs. So we have to understand how to address such types of problems and go for a more refined solution over there. We will also consider three-dimensional problem in continuum mechanics. While so far you were always considering 
two dimensional problems but now we will go for one dimension extra and see how such types of problems can be addressed in its true sense and then lastly we have the energy theorem so here where we will have the problems addressed in terms of strain energy the complementary energy and see how some problems can be tackled in a better way by using these energy concepts now let us consider the primary objective of a structural engineer when he deals with topics in structural engineering his primary objective in structural engineering is to design or is to plan for example plan design and detail a structural system which will carry safely the loads coming on it normally no one gives you a ready made uh, you can say solution to the problem a vague description of problem is given then you have to see what options are available select some of the options then go for further detailing and so on and so forth. so you need to select a structural system for that matter so we say we have first of all a structural system for a specific purpose you might select a system for example if you want to provide an industrial roof for example a big shed is to be constructed so your objective is to provide a shed now whether you will use frames for covering that or trusses or maybe arches or maybe you may use steel as a material or you may use concrete or anything else so we say that various options are available and you as a structural engineer has to take bold decision keeping in view the specific requirements of the client and the situation present at the site or the construction location and select a structural system once you select the structural system we say that it has to be designed or analyzed and so on for carrying some loads and then we say that this load is to be carried by the structure or structural system safely and efficient so we say that we have to have first of all the structural system it has to carry loads and it has to carry loads safely and efficiently in addition to that there are many objectives or points to be remembered while planning the structural system like its constructability whether can you construct such a such a structure whether material technology is available for its construction or not because many times people do come across problems during the construction and then they have to take major decision or abandon the structure as such causing lot of loss to the client the industry and so on and so later on i will narrate some of the examples where people had to rework lot of things during the construction of the structure and that had many times results into loss of time extra uh, expenses involved and so on and so forth. so now we say that first of all we have to select the structure now when you say that structure is to be selected then first of all we must have some idea as to what is meant by a structure now structure you can say in general is defined as an assemblage of members or elements suitably connected to each other and supported so that it carries loads coming on it safely and transfer the same to the support or foundation so it's an assemblage of members or elements that you are now considering so many members are connected or assembled in some way or the other and then you get a structure which carries the loads and transfers it to the foundation or fixed points and so on and so forth. so if that is the way a structural engineer is defining a structure let us see how a common man looks at structure so we say that as far as the structure is concerned we need members or the elements which may be one or two or three dimensional elements are connected to each other and then you have got the entire structure over if that is the case 
then we will say that let us see how we classify the structure because you have got an assemblage of members so first of all let us see how a layman understands a structure so for a layman or structure he may say he may look at a building and say that oh that building is a structure so he sees around him tall buildings constructed this way or that way using different materials and he understands oh that's a structure or you can see many bridges are being built these days so you have got those bridges suspension bridges or normal bridges concrete bridges rcc bridges steel bridges and so on and so forth so a common way we will say oh yes bridge is also a structure or he sees tanks fluid container tanks where either the liquefied gases are stored or maybe liquid is stored gases are stored and so on some fluids are there inside under some pressure and a common man will say oh that's a structure which stores something then you have got the retaining wall constructed to retain soil when you have got landscaping to be done or when soil is to be retained where the level difference in the ground is to be accounted for so you have to provide some retaining walls which retains the earth at some level and then a common man will say yes that seems to be a structure if you consider dams you now that is another massive structure civil engineering structure where we say that on one side you have got a massive mass of water and that entire mass of water is stored for some purpose and then you will say that the massive dam that you have got with water on one side is one type of structure which a common man will understand he will say that yes dam also is a structure if you consider flying objects like an aircraft yes aircraft carries massive load these days hundreds of human beings being transported plus the furniture inside various systems inside the luggage and so on and so forth so all of that is transported which means you have to carry the weight and support it properly take it from one place to the other place and so on. so we say that yes aircraft can be considered to be a structure then you have got the ship which floats on water so these days you get massive ship which are used for various purposes transportation of materials human beings and that is all a floating structure it has to carry several loads in terms of its own weight the weight carried by it the waves the wind and so on and so forth. then we see that we have got another type of structure which we see around and that is an automobile so automobile is also you can say kind of structure very delicate structure but extensively used for different purposes transportation of human beings goods solids semi solids liquid and so on and so forth so it has to be designed or it has to be finally safe against various types of loads so we see that automobile also a car can be considered to be a structure then we see around us many times the roads or the railways or the pipelines going through a hill or a mountain so massive tunnels are constructed recently we have seen in himalayas in uh, you can say kashmir and so on at many places people have constructed very long tunnels in mumbai also we see we have got one tunnel on the freeway eastern freeway almost half a kilometer long which is used for uh, cutting across the distance and uh, reducing the cost of the running of vehicles and so on and so forth but it has to be properly designed for the entire soil weight coming from above so you have to estimate properly how much load will be coming on the lining that you provide on the 
surface of the tunnel or inside the tunnel and so on. Then we have another type of structure called as jetty. You must have seen such types of berthing jetties in the ocean or in can say large rivers where ships are uh, supposed to uh, wait there carry out loading and loading operations. So you need ship to have a firm support against waves, wind and so on and so forth and provide a safe passage for goods human beings and so on and so on. Then we have another type of structure which we see many times in big cities like Mumbai. When you move out, you will see at many locations where tall buildings are under construction. You will see such tower cranes. They are used to take materials at different locations and these tower cranes are an integral part of a high-rise building construction where you will see that initially the crane has got some height then the height is increased from below it is pushed up up and finally it goes to the highest point in the building in fact much more than the highest point in the building above its terrace because the entire construction material has to be transported finishing items are to be transported so that is all possible only with the use of such types of tower cranes. <clears throat> Sometimes you also see balloons used for entertainment, for transporting human beings or for uh, weather prediction. Meteorological department also uses these types of balloons for sending their equipments in space and then monitoring or measuring some parameters at different elevations for uh, predicting the weather and so on and so on. So we see that a layman just see the purpose for which a structure is constructed and then accordingly understands the structure like. While if that is one way to look at the structure, we will say that for an engineer the classification is reasonably different, quite different for that matter. An engineer will say, oh, my beam is a structure. So he will say, okay, fine. Forget the building or the bridge or anything. But if there is a beam carrying some transverse load, oh, that's a structure. Or if there is a column which carries axial load, tall columns supporting vertical loads, then he will say, yeah, that's a structure for me. For Engineer, there might be an arch for a specific purpose, aesthetics or carrying loads and so on. But he, if you see an arch, then you will see that yes, that is another type of structure, different than the beam or the column. Then you have many times cables used for uh, transportation to remote places, hills or uh, you can say forks and so on. Many times such rides are provided uh, in hill stations where the access is not so easy. So such types of cables are provided for transporting main or material from one place to the other place. And so, so big towers are provided at the ends as supports and you have the cables on which the trolleys are supposed to move or the suspended you can say containers. Uh, go from one point to the other point and so on and so on. For an engineer, he might say, oh, the truss might be one of the structure. Many times you see on the railway stations, foot, of, foot over bridges or in industrial structures, you see roof trusses. So for an engineer, if he sees truss, then he will say, that, yeah, that's a structure for him. While if you, many times you see frames, different than the trusses. We will see the difference later on. But we will say that as far as frames are concerned, these are one type of structures which an engineer will understand. It may be a plane frame in one plane, all the members in one plane and the load is also in the same plane. Why? It might be a three-dimensional frame where the structure itself is spread in all the dimensions and subjected to loads in different directions, different planes and so on. 
then you have some types floor grid system you must have seen such types of floor grid systems being used at many locations where large spans are to be covered it has got different aesthetics so sometimes architects prefer this kind of uh, structure an engineer can definitely uh, design such types of structures for uh, architectural requirements then you have got many times slabs flat slabs slabs with you can say drop panels and so on so a slab engineer will understand as a structure while for an engineer there is another type of structures called as shell so shell is different than slab a curved surface for that matter that curve may be of any type one type is shown in this particular sketch but many types are available later on when you study the topic of shell in detail you will come across different types of shells the forces developed by them and so on and so forth then you have many times folded plate structures which also you have seen perhaps at several locations where flat plates are provided in this fashion for roofing purpose and then you have different type of structure for that matter called as folded plates then you have three dimensional solids many times foundation blocks are provided for machines different machines rotating machines generators compressors and so on so those massive machines are to be properly supported with their dynamic characteristics so many times such block foundations are provided to cater for specific loads coming on the foundation and so on and so on. then you have the plain stress problem which we will be studying in this semester like a, you can say a bracket or a thin beam which lies in one plane and the load is also in the same plane such types of structures are called as plain stress structures and the problems are addressed as plain stress problem then you have plain strain problem you have got a long retaining wall where everywhere the section is same so instead of treating it as a three dimensional structure you can take it as a two dimensional structure take a slice of that and then uh, design one slice maybe 1 meter long and then whatever the results you get they are repeated for the entire uh, length of the retaining wall same happens for the dam or the tunnel and so so one slice is taken provided of course throughout the length the forces are same the section is same and so on and so forth. then you also get an axisymmetric solid like a you can see the cooling towers where these cooling towers are used in many processes thermal power stations require such cooling towers many of the chemical or the cement industry they also require cooling towers the pharmaceutical companies require cooling towers air conditioning plants require cooling towers and so on so we see that an engineer would classify structures differently so there is a structural system for a common man functional requirement distinguishes one type of structure from the other while for an engineer the criteria are different <coughs> so now we say that having considered different types of structures let us see what are the building blocks of the structure because we have seen that a structure is an assemblage of elements <coughs> so what are the different types of elements which are available so we will say we have got a truss element where all the members carry either the tensile force or the compressive force <coughs> and you have a beam element where members can carry shear force or the bending moment then you have two or three dimensional frame element <coughs> where members carry or the elements carry axial force shear force bending moment or maybe torsional moment for three dimensional frames and so on then you have slab element where many times you have got a continuum as a slab <coughs> it's not a line element but it's a two dimensional element where we say that 
it internally carries bending moments, the twisting moments, the shear, and so on and so on. Then you have the plane stress element, which we will be studying in detail in the present course. Sir. You have the plane strain element in terms of dams, retaining wall, tunnels, so on. Then you have the membrane element for balloons or shells, <coughs> where only in plane forces are considered. Then you have the shell element, where general types of forces are considered in plane bending and so on and so forth and you have got a solid element like that of a foundation block where different types of stresses are envisaged in its behavior and so forth. So we say that we have got these different types of structures <coughs> as a building block. The structure has to carry the loads which we have indicated that you have an assemblage of elements which has to carry the loads. So what types of loads now we say would a structure has to carry? One of that is the gravity load, its own weight or maybe some weight kept on it and so on. Then you have the inertia forces due to seismic effect, due to vibration, due to moving loads on bridges and so on and so forth. Then you have the wind loads on the structure become very important for roof light roof, fabric structures and so on. Even for tall buildings, you will see that many times their design is governed by wind loads. Then you have thermal loads where you have to deal with changes of temperature, maybe annual change of temperature, the maximum to minimum in a year, natural change of temperature. So sometimes man-made change of temperature like in some process, you have to deal with high temperatures. In that case, you will have to consider the effect of such high temperatures on the supporting structure and then take that as a load applied on the structure. You have wave forces applied on the offshore structures where continuously you have waves hitting the structure, offshore structure or even onshore structure where they are very close to the seashore you will see that they are intermittently subjected to wave forces during high tide or during storm and so on and so on. Then you have electromagnetic force in many of the electrical equipments where the magnetic or electromagnetic forces are developed. Many times the structure is subjected to such kinds of forces in transformers and so on particularly where a structure has to be designed for that. Then you have got many times structures subjected to blast load or the impact loads. For various reasons, such types of loads are inevitable in some types of structures and you have to design the structure for them. As we have seen that a civil engineering structure has to generally rest on foundation and if the foundation itself settles and if you can predict beforehand how much it is going to settle when the full load is applied, then you have to design the structure for that settlement, which may be either <coughs> differential settlement occurring for different columns or different foundation systems and so on. Then you have imperfections in manufacturing of materials or structures. Many times, the manufacturing of material itself induces some stresses which many times are required to be released or the, during the fabrication of the structure you have some imperfections in it like the length may not be exact as per your required geometry so you have to force fit the member pushing the joints outward or inward causing additional forces in the different members of the structure then you have the buoyancy forces to design structures which are floating. So you need to consider buoyancy and then see how they are to be properly taken care of. Then you have creep and shrinkage, particularly in case of concrete structures, you have to deal with this creep and shrinkage. Creep is due to sustained loading. Same load is kept for a long time, induces additional deformations 
additional stresses in the structure and due to shrinkage of concrete during its hardening process also we say that these internal forces are developed in the structure and we have the hydrostatic forces or the soil pressure on retaining wall on water retaining structure like dams and so on you need to design the structure for the water pressure hydrostatic pressure or the soil pressure for retaining wall and so on so when all these loads are applied on the structure let us see what effect the load has on the structure so we say first of all when the load is applied on the structure the structure deforms whatever the type of deflection possible in the given structure which we will see shortly then you have the structure developing internal forces or stresses due to these deformations and the structure develops finally the reactions because it has to transform transfer the entire load on it to some fixed point where it is supported so we say that the structure responds in these ways it deforms it develops internal forces or stresses and it develops reactions at the support so first of all let us see what kind of deflections would occur in the structure for a truss element if you consider a truss it will undergo three deflections at each joint linear deflections x y z direction as u v w then you will have a beam carrying some transverse load undergoing a transverse deflection and a rotation then you have a plane frame or a space frame undergoing either three deflections for plane frame a horizontal a vertical and a rotation about normal axis or three linear and three rotational displacements and you have a slab undergoing three deflections one out of plane displacement and two is two and three the rotations occurring in usually perpendicular directions then you have the plane stress element which we will see in detail in the present course work undergoing linear deflections in x and y direction assuming that structure lies in xy plane similarly for plane strain we will have the linear deflections u and v and you have the membrane element undergoing in plane deflections only and some out of plane deflections the behavior will decide what kind of deflections are to be considered then you have the shell a general shell undergoing three types of deflections linear u v w and three types of rotation theta x theta y and theta z while a solid element like a solid block we will say at any point it undergoes three deflections in x y z direction as u v w so these are the deflections which we envisage in the different types of elements as far as the internal forces or stresses are concerned then we see that a truss if you consider a member of a truss it will develop axial force tension or compression it will develop for a beam element the shear force and the bending moment as far as plane frame is concerned it will develop axial force or shear force or bending moment if it is a three dimensional frame then it will develop in addition to these three forces the shear force in two directions and the bending moments in three different directions out of that one may be torsion and two remaining may be bending about the different axis then you have the slab element undergoing a transverse shear shear force a torsional moment and a bending moment about the two axes then you have the plane stress element undergoing or developing three types of stresses in its own plane sigma x sigma y and tau xy <clears throat> then we have plane strain element developing sigma x sigma y sigma z and tau xy in plane then you have the membrane element developing in plane stresses sigma x sigma y 
then you have the shell developing in plane forces nx ny nxy out of plane shear qx qy and moments mx my and mxy while solid element develops three stresses in normal direction and three shear stresses as far as the internal forces are concerned, when we say that various types of forces are developed by different elements, for example, the list which I have shown you, if you summarize all of that, then we will say that as far as only the forces are concerned, we have only four types of forces to be considered, the axial force, the shear force, the bending moment and the torsional. The internal forces, no matter what structure you consider, you have to only determine four types of forces the shear force, the axial force, the bending moment about two mutually perpendicular directions and torsional. As far as the internal stresses are concerned again if you see the list you have got a normal stress sigma x may be tensile or sigma x may be compressive whatever the normal stress so you have got normal stress causing two different effects tension or compression and then you have got a shear stress on a given plane so we say that no matter what element you consider you have to consider only three stresses the types of stresses are only two but as far as sign is concerned sometimes you have to deal with the compressive stress differently because of the material behavior over there. <clears throat> as far as the reactions and the supports are concerned, because we have seen a structure on being subjected to load, deforms, develops internal forces and develops the reaction or transfers everything to the supports as reactions. So if it is a free support not uh, offering any resistance at all, then we say that there is no reaction. If there is a roller support, then there is a reaction in the direction perpendicular to the plane on which the roller is moving. If you consider a hinge support, then we say that Rx, Ry, Rz, then the three linear reactions are possible for the most general type of hinge that you are considering. Or for a fixed support, you have got three linear reactions Rx, Ry, Rz and mx, my, mz as the moments at the support. While many times you have to deal with elastic or semi-elastic or semi-rigid supports, where we see that the reactions in their cases are proportional to the deformations in the support. So if your support medium is very stiff, then it will develop reaction as per the deformation occurring there. So we say that depending upon the type of support medium you have got, the reactions will be developed. Then as far as the structure is concerned, we have seen that apart from its form that you have got providing or the type of structure, you have to also consider the material that you are going to use for the structure. Now material is a vast field, later on those of you who study that in detail, you will see that very challenging field is offered by this branch of you can say interdisciplinary engineering faculty where materials of structure because different industries require different types of materials and the continuous development in this field is enormous. As far as the materials of structures are concerned, we say that we have got broad classification of these materials in terms of natural material, man-made material, then we have the combination material, we have the structural material, we have sometimes the aesthetic material, or we have the functional material and so on. Many other classifications are possible, but I have selected few for our brief discussion. Natural materials, now many of you, I mean all of you are aware of many of these materials, the soil, 
which we anyway come across for any structure. Then we have got the stone and the natural material. We have got the sand, the crushed sand or the natural sand. We have got the timber as naturally occurring from the trees, obtained from the trees. Then you have got the natural fibers like jute. So these natural fibers are sometimes used for different applications. Then you have got the human hair or animal hair again used for specific applications. You have got the skin of animals used for different purposes. You have got bones also used for different purposes depending on its characteristics. Then you have got water as a natural material with its incompressibility as very important property and we have got air as its compressible material but offering lots of challenges when you come across structures we have to deal with air inflated uh, behavior and so in the man-made material you have got bricks which many times we use for walls or retaining walls or various applications then you have got concrete, a very popular material for civil engineer. You have got metals used in different applications. You have got non-metals also used in different applications. Then you have got polymers, specific areas are considered for that. You have got man-made fibers in uh, also used like uh, cloths or rubber cloths roofing for that and so on then you have got combination materials many times different materials are combined to get some property like alloys you have got compounds you have got concrete with admixtures giving you specific properties reinforced concrete where some material like concrete is good in compression you have got reinforcement good in tension as well as compression combined together to get the desired effect then you have the structural material like steel, concrete, fibers in fiber reinforced matrix and so on which may be in composite material some of you might study. Then you have got some materials which have got aesthetic properties like plaster for uh, concrete or brick surface. You have got flooring to be provided on concrete slab and so on or maybe paint for various reason aesthetics and so on. You have got insulating materials many times used for heat insulation, sound insulation and so on. And you have got many times materials used for specific function like sound or heat insulation. You have got retarders used in concrete to delay the process of hardening. You have got accelerators to accelerate the process of hardening depending upon the application that you have in mind. Doping is used many times in electronic material to achieve a specific property for the base material and so on. And you have got fire insulating materials many times. You require fire rating for any civil engineering structures or human occupancy structure. You have a certain fire rating that it shouldn't get damaged in maybe one hour, two hours, four hours, whatever it is. So you have to provide an insulating material in such applications and so on. Now, as far as materials are concerned, we make some assumptions regarding materials. The most important assumption made for all these years that you have been using and we will continue to use that in our major areas of application is isotropy. That is, properties are same in all directions. Like in steel or metal structures, many times we presume that properties are same in all directions. Then we have the homogeneity where properties are same everywhere. They may be different in different directions, but they are same everywhere. So that is another type of, you can say, assumption made regarding properties of the materials. And then you have elasticity, which of course we will be extensively using. That we presume that the material that we are going to consider is linearly elastic. The Hooke's law is applicable and on removal of load we expect the deformations to be zero and the load is directly 
I mean, deflection is directly proportional to loads. So that is elasticity. Now, having considered these basic definitions and the basic classification, let us see how the real problems in life, in structural engineering, of course, present challenge. For example, while studying various theories in strength of materials, you have made many assumptions, like in theory of bending. You have made assumptions, plane section before bending, remain plane after bending, and so on and so forth. Now, many of these assumptions many times fail to get realized in practice. The result of that is you have made some assumptions about the behavior of the structural member, but it doesn't behave that way. The result of that is you predict the behavior in some way, it's going to deform so much, or it's going to take safely so much load, and so on how the stresses will be within this limit and so on. But in reality, we find a lot of discrepancy in what you predict and what you actually observe. So we say that if that is going to happen, then we need a more refined theory rather than the elementary theories that we have been using. Then we have many times very heavy loads applied on structure or you have got supports which offer different types of reactions or you have got different members connected to each other. The result of that is at such points the local stresses are much different than what you get at a gross level. So a member of a truss we say in general will carry axial force but at the joint where several members are connected to each other by either pins or rivets or they are welded and so on. There we see that the local stresses are quite different. Sometimes they are so different that if they are not properly accounted for, they can result into failure of the structure. So we say that if such situations are to be properly understood and provided against for failure, then we say that we need to go for more refined theories in solid mechanics. If you have got a beam which is quite deep, then obviously our normal theory of bending is not capable of predicting its behavior deep deep. So we need a more refined theory for this analysis. In roller or ball bearings, again we see that at the contact point, the stresses many times are very high. It is very difficult to predict how the stresses vary internally. Therefore, we need more refined theories for that. Then, in many locations, you come across members changing their sizes. For individual sizes, you are able to predict by normal elementary theory what will be the stresses and so on. But at the interface where the sizes change, we see that the stresses vary sharply. They shoot up also sharply, and many times they result into failure also. So we need to properly understand at such situations how the stresses vary, how they are different than those predicted by normal or elementary theory of stress analysis and so on. Sometimes we have to deal with the torsion of non-circular section. You have already considered in earlier courses torsion of circular section. But many times we have to deal with non-circular section like an eye section or a channel or a, you can say rectangular section, hollow or solid. Then if we have to consider such types of sections under torsion or elementary theory of torsion where we consider warping to be neglected which later on we will address, then we need to have a refined theory for understanding the behavior of such types of sections. <clears throat> then we have the semi-infinite medium or the infinite medium. Then you have got a point load applied say on the foundation. So on one side there is nothing and on the surface below you have got a vast soil medium. So we say that you are dealing with a semi-infinite medium. Similarly, you can deal with 
infinite medium where you have got <coughs> a large you can say <coughs> force applied internally at ground and you have to consider very carefully its dispersion through the medium in all directions. <coughs> Historically, we will say that in 17th, 18th century, people have started discussing theoretically the behavior of members, elastic bars, beams, columns and so on. Because of the need of the time where rails were being constructed, bridges were constructed or there was a need to construct bridges, tunnels and so on. So people wanted to understand as to how to go about it rationally. Accordingly, many more, many theories were developed by the scientists and engineers of those times, which are used as, you can say, foundation for the present day uh, studies in mechanics or solid mechanics for that matter. Now, when these engineers and scientists wanted to study in detail the behavior of different types of materials they had developed and later on many people have refined the tools of structural analysis which we summarize into three types or three different tools. One is you have got the equations of equilibrium <coughs> depending upon the type of structure and the forces that it develops you will have the equations of equilibrium. You will have the compatibility of deflections that the structure will deform in such a way that no gaps or overlaps are provided or developed in the structure due to the application of loads. And then you have the linear elasticity, Hooke's law, material property, which is also to be considered while analyzing the structure and so on and so forth. So we say that the concept of stress analysis is all that now we have to consider and accordingly we will now see over here the stresses developed at different points how the stresses are to be firstly denoted how they are to be properly named and then later on how they are used in structural analysis i think uh, today we will stop at this point and go with the details of the stresses, its notations, its effect in terms of strains and so on in the next lecture. Thank you.